feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Shrimp Tank. Uh, we're actually virtual today. Sometimes we're in uh, Alpharetta or Woodstock or another part of the country, but I'm your co-host, Ted Jenkin, here with my co-host, Lee Heisman. And every single week on The Shrimp Tank, uh, we bring you some of the brightest and best CEOs, entrepreneurs, and business owners across the country. We talk to you about what it takes to basically start a business, grow a business, and maybe even exit stage left and sell it one day. Uh, we're excited in just a minute to bring on Michael Cicluna. Uh, he's a partner in high country finance, and he's been a tremendous tax expert, accounting expert, an outsourced CFO for many companies over the years. So we're actually going to get some real insight to this whole business efficiency, growth, and the tax side of this uh, construct of a business altogether. A couple of housekeeping notes in here for everybody. If you're just watching this for the first time, you can always go to shrimptankpodcast.com. You can see some of the 500 episodes that Lee and I have done with some of the most prominent people across the country. Tony Horton from P90X, Brian Dawkins from the Philadelphia Eagles, Hall of Fame Safety, Dave Wazalewski, who is one of the co-founders of Spanx, Dr. Michael Bruce, the number one sleep doctor in the country, and so many more business owners, small and large and in between, that have figured out this combination of book smarts and street smarts as they've been able to grow their business. Uh, our cities are doing tremendously well in Boca Raton and Charleston and Seattle and cities all around the country because... People really want to learn today about what it takes to become an entrepreneur. As always, uh, if you listen to us in the car, just go to Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or anywhere on the internet. Um, gentlemen, I'm excited about this topic today. And, and Michael, I want to just start off and talk about this concept that I believe that we're not even close to the pinnacle right now of how many people are going to start up a side hustle as part of their family finances. And so many people ask Lee and I, I'm thinking about doing a side hustle. It can be as small as opening up a store on eBay to as large as making an investment in, in a big business. Where does somebody even start when they're thinking about starting a business? So my personal recommendation is read a book if you want to if you if you want to start a business I, I don't want to tell you go into real estate or you know do some online e-com store or anything like that because you every individual is going to have a, a different uh, propensity to what is going to work best for them um, I've seen entrepreneurs be incredibly successful in tons of different industries I've, I've had success myself in different industries but I've also heard of people hating certain industries that others love. Um, real estate's the, the best example. You can talk to two different people in real estate and one person says, it's the best thing I ever did. I love it. It's, it's so easy. And the next person says, it's such a headache. I can't believe I got into this. I just want to sell all my properties. It's the worst. Um, my, my journey actually started with a, a book that I'm sure a lot of people started with, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, oh, yeah. I love That's Guy Kawasaki. Yep. Yeah. So in, in one of his books, he actually does talk about the fact that, you know, he got into real estate, but he said, if real estate's not for you, that's okay. You just got to figure out something that is a side hustle. Um, so the first thing, read some books. The second thing, just try something. My very first company was, uh, I, I went on to Alibaba. I ordered a bunch of neckties had them shipped over, did a photo shoot, made a website on Wix.com and just started selling. It was, it was very small. It was nothing fancy. It didn't go anywhere. Made a little bit of profit. But the way I saw it is I put $500 into that to start. And I, I came at it thinking, okay, if I put $500 into this, that is my investment into the education. I'm going to learn as much as I can as I build this business. So Read a bunch of books. You're going to learn from other people's mistakes, but you've got to get your feet wet. And so don't wait for the perfect opportunity. Just try something. doesn't matter what you try, just as long as you try something. And you may love it. You may hate it, but you've got to understand that it's going to be a learning experience. So, Michael, I have to jump in uh, again. Thank you for coming on the program today. All the way from Australia. No, I'm kidding, actually. All the <laughs> way from Utah, of course, but 
starting in Australia. Uh, quick question for you. You know, I, I was reading your bio and you claim to be a master of something. And what I love, and this is important because a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they don't understand the concept of cash flow, cash flow analysis and cash flow projections. Now, people mm -hmm. always just say, well, I'm looking in my bank account and that's how much money I have. And I think there might be some money coming, but I'm not really putting and connecting the dots of my expenses and, and where my money's going. So cash flow mm -hmm. analysis and projection seems to be your sweet spot. Can you speak to that for new entrepreneurs or even experienced entrepreneurs? Yeah. So uh, I, I like that you mentioned the bank account because every entrepreneur, they check their bank account every day. You're not a real entrepreneur if you don't check your bank account every day. And, and in the beginning, it makes a lot of sense. You, you really do need to be very closely attuned with what's in your bank account because that really is your cash flow. It doesn't get very complex in the first little bit of your business. As your business does grow and as you hire employees or you outsource parts of your company and other people are working on your company, you're not going to know every single little expense or, or bit of revenue coming in. Uh, it doesn't, it's not as easy as just looking at the bank account and knowing, oh yeah, I'm supposed to get $2,000 here. I'm spending $1,000 there. There's going to be a lot more intricacies that are involved in that. So the idea of cash flow, um, most CEOs, they know what a P&L is, tells them their net income. That, that's easy. They know what a balance sheet is. They very rarely know how to read it. And they know that a cash flow statement exists, but they have no idea what it looks like or what it's supposed to tell them. Um, the P&L obviously is important. However, whenever I look at a new company, when, I, when I'm you know, looking at consulting, doing CFO work or accounting work, the first thing I do is I ask for the balance sheet. I actually don't really care about looking at the P&L. Not until I've looked at the balance sheet, because if the balance sheet is incorrect, then the P&L is incorrect. That number one rule in, in accounting, if the balance sheet is incorrect, then the P&L is incorrect. Let me interrupt, Michael. I have to interrupt. And Ted, you'll appreciate yeah. this. You know, over the years, Michael, we've done cumulatively across the country, what, Ted, well over 1,000 or 1,200 podcasts. I've met with so many business analysts. Yep. I've met with so many entrepreneurs. And most people immediately look at the P&L. That's all they're looking at. And, and I will tell you, it's quite funny. I was giving this analogy, Michael, and, and I hope you like it enough. I was describing the importance of the balance sheet. I said a P&L is like going to a doctor's office. The doctor look at you and you, they can tell your health and wellness from the color of your eyes, how your skin looks, your general affect. And I said, you know, a P&L is like a doctor giving you a visual examination, maybe some blood pressure, maybe they listen to your heart. But the balance sheet is like a full X-ray. It's an MRI. It's the X-ray. It's, uh, you know, Ted, the, the equipment that we went to in Switzerland, Ted, where it gives you the full bone scan and density exactly. scan. Exactly. So it's it's funny, Michael. I had just used this analogy the other day that when someone focuses on the P&L, I feel they're a little bit of a hack. And when they immediately go to the balance sheet, they're getting a much more deeper picture of the true health and wellness of a business. Is that accurate? 100%. I actually have a similar, a similar analogy that um, there are a lot of uh, companies out there that they look like a Ferrari, but you open up the hood and, and it's, uh, it's got a four-cylinder engine under there. Ah, exactly. Not running very yeah. well. Michael, so, by the way, if you use my doctor's analogy in the future, you better email me. You stick with yeah, your Ferrari yeah. one or else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, the, the reason why most entrepreneurs don't look at the balance sheet is because when they do look at the balance sheet, they have no idea what's going on. Um, they, they look that you know, you start at the top and you see your bank account. Okay, I've got money in my bank account. Maybe that <laughs> what it says on your balance sheet doesn't match what's in your bank account. And then already you're lost. But then you start moving down and you see some assets, you see maybe inventory or accounts receivable, um, maybe some, some loan receivables that you've got. You know, those tend to make sense, but the further you get down, it just gets more and more complex. Now you've got your payables, you've got uh, fixed assets, you, you've got your equity accounts. No one ever has their equity accounts correct, let alone understands them. So as an entrepreneur, if you don't understand what's going on in your balance sheet, then you're not going to understand your cash flow. And this comes back to your original question: why is cash flow so, so important? Cash flow is what tells you why not just not just actual cash, but why your PL and balance sheet are giving you the numbers that they're giving you. So your PL, well, let me tell you, the most 
frustrating question that I hear from, from CEOs where they're frustrated is they say, my net income says I made 500,000, but my bank account only increased 200,000. It's like, okay, well, of course, because you sold 500,000 or you sold 10 million worth of revenue, but you only collected on X amount, but then you paid out X amount. And that's what the cash flow statement tells you. It says, okay, we increased revenue by this much. We paid out this much. We collected on this much. We paid this much in loans. Like it's going to show you how that cash actually essentially has been moving. And once you understand how the cash has been moving, then you can make serious and, and real decisions mm -hmm. on what needs to happen moving forward. Um, one of the, the biggest downfalls of inventory based companies is cash flow because they, when you have inventory, you got to put forward money to buy the inventory so that you can make the sale. It's not like in the service industry, you just, you make the sale and then you do the work. It's you know not very difficult. Um, but a lot of inventory based companies will go under because their cash flow is, is just not very well taken care of. So understanding how to optimize your cash flow and then also forecast that cash flow. If you just say, we're going to go get a loan, we get a loan for 250,000, we go purchase a bunch of inventory, but you have no idea whether or not you're going to be able to make the payments on that loan. That's how you can end up having the bank come after you and, and seize your assets and have the business go out. What about the, the new business owners that are, are watching this and they, you know, they get on YouTube and they start surfing the internet and they're wondering, I start my business today. Should I be an LLC? Should I be a corporation? And then they hear S corps and C corps. How, for the novice out there, how do how should they think about this when they start their company? That's a really good question. Um, I I think that in general, there are, I, every business is going to be different. There's there's different reasons for starting a business in a different formation. Um, however, most small companies are going to want to start as an LLC S corporation. Um, I'll give you some examples of someone who might not. If you're going to start a software company and you've got uh, a heavy amount of investors and you know that the goal is within five years to um, do within five years to do two or three different seed rounds of investment, I wouldn't recommend going an LLC at that point. Very few entrepreneurs, and especially when we're talking about side hustle entrepreneurs, actually want to go that route. So if you're doing a side hustle, Nine times out of 10, you're going to want to go an LLC S corporation. And, and I'll explain why. An LLC is, it's a limited liability company. And the way that it works is you actually set up as an LLC. That's the legal entity type. You then get to separate yourself, uh, you, you personally, and your personal assets from the business and its assets. So basically then if someone comes and sues your business and tries to take everything from the business they can't actually come after you personally so it separates you gives you uh you've probably heard of piercing the corporate veil stops that corporate veil from being pierced naturally the the second benefit of an llc is when it comes to taxes you then get to choose how you're going to file your taxes so you get to basically put on a mask when it comes to tax time and say i'm going to put on the s corporation mask or i'm going to put on the c corporation mask so based on what's going to be most beneficial to you from a tax perspective, you, you elect to file taxes in that status. So the S corporation is the most common because of the pass through taxes. And the way that that works is uh, if I make, let's say right. $100,000 in a year um, in, in the company net income, then that all of that money is considered a distribution to me. So now that money has been distributed to me, it's now considered income to me personally, and I pay taxes on it personally. The second part of it is then you, um, you're able to, well, required to, but also able to pay yourself a salary out of that, uh, out of that company. Uh, the, the worst kind of tax is FICA tax. I don't know if you guys know FICA tax, but that's your social security sure. and Medicare. If you haven't run a business, you don't know how bad this tax is. It's the worst because when you're an employee, you pay that 7.65% on average. 
but you don't realize that the employer, the person who is paying your, your salary, they're also paying another 7.65%. So now when you're the business owner and the employer, you pay both. So you're paying about 15% tax on that. And that's on top of the whatever tax bracket you fall into. So in an S corporation, if you make 100,000 in net income, you choose a, a reasonable and ordinary salary to pay yourself. In that case, I'd probably say about $30,000. Rule of thumb is about a third. And then you only have to pay that 15% on $30,000 rather than the full $100,000. So there's, there's quite a few tax strategies that go into go, going the LLC S corporation route. However, as always, I'm going to recommend that you, you know, speak to a tax professional and a lawyer um, to, to make that formation and, and make sure that it makes sense for you. Michael, uh, generally, is, it is going to be an LLC S Corp. Michael, first, great information. You're exactly right. And, you know, Ted and I know this, so we're so glad the listeners and the viewers are watching this. I will tell you, no matter how much I preach what you're saying, no one looks at me the same way I'm looking at you because of the accent. If I had that accent, <laughs> there is no question I would be much more deliberate with my speak. I would be much more slow, and I would have the full attention of my audience. So <laughs> there's so much cachet and credibility from your accent. Let me talk about something else with you, and you speak of it. You advise clients on investments and diversifying a portfolio. Michael, here in the United States, of course, the stock market is one investment strategy and arm, which has proven to be a, an almost emotional reaction to Twitter or potentially soon to be thread. And the the methodology and mechanics behind the stock market has changed to this emotional investment, not for you as the investor, but for those companies and what's happening in the market. You know, Ted and I also look into so many different alternative investment strategies. And I want you to speak of it. We actually are doing a company, we work intimately with a company called Roots. And it's an amazing program, Michael. I'd love for you to look into it and called Invest with Roots. And you know, for you, your clientele, we're going to connect you with them after this. Uh, they're a local firm here, but they really revolutionized the uh, owning a uh, real estate space for a lot of investors. But what do you recommend to your clientele? Yeah, so um, I, I recommend clients assess the level of risk that they're willing to take. And when I say level of risk, it's not one scale. You may consider risk being uh, how much time you're willing to put into it and, and whether or not you're willing to um, you know, throw money into the stock market. If you don't want to put much time into it, that may be the risk that you want to take. If you, have no, if, if you have no desire to look into those investments, then the risk is you're letting somebody else manage your money. You have no control. Or you may want to take the risk of trusting in yourself. So you, you look at it and say, okay, well, I think that I'm, I know the stock market or I can research and everything and I can figure things out on my own. And you build that risk there. Though that's one spectrum. The other spectrum is, are you willing to risk um, your leveraging debt? So, so that's real estate. Um, I think the way Root works, you don't actually leverage debt, correct? You actually um, go in with other, other investors. Is that right? Ted, I know you can speak a little more. Yeah, yeah, you no, that's right. you're, you're, you're leveraging other investors. You don't have to take on any debt at all. Yeah, there you go. So you got a great market opportunity, um, but you don't leverage as much debt. So, uh, and, and then the other one that I like to talk about is some people don't want to risk uh, a, a full world collapse. And so they're saying, I don't want to risk that at all. So I'm going to go buy a bunch of food storage and build a bunker and have gold and silver and guns. And that's, that's my investment. That's my long-term investment. I think that a diversified portfolio, I actually, one of my pet peeves in the finance industry is you talk to any finance guru and they say, you got to have a diversified portfolio. And what they mean is have this type of stock and that type of stock and, and some other type of stock. That's not diversified at all because if the stock market crashes, they all go to crap. When I say diversified portfolio, I mean, have a little bit in stock have a little bit in real estate, have a little bit in a side hustle, maybe even have a little bit in gold and silver. But that is diversified. Because then to me, if the stock market crashes, well, I've still got my rental properties. If, if the rental market crashes, well, I've still got my side hustle. If my side hustle goes to crap, well, I've still got my gold and silver. That's a diversified portfolio. Rather than just being in different markets within the stock market, you're actually now leveraging different levels of control. 
So how much control do you have on the marketability of the investments that you're, that, that you're putting your money into and time? You know, you were mentioned on here about the personal finance and, you know, when you run a business, obviously you want to have a separation of church and state and on personal finances, they always talk about having an emergency cash reserve, right? The what ifs or what happens and every business is going to go through bad times. It could be because of a recession. It could be regulatory related. It could be industry related. How do you coach business owners to think about the cash reserves in the business and and the preparation for things like legal lawsuits, it turn you know turn downs in the economy. You know, obviously the pandemic was an extreme, but it happens. How do, how do you coach business owners to think about this? Because sometimes they start milking the business like it's a cow, and they don't mm -hmm. think that anything's going to go wrong, and then all of a sudden they got get caught shorthanded. Yeah, so I'll give you two answers. First answer is in, in the world of finance, you have a spectrum of um, risk taking. On the one end, you have Dave Ramsey, and he is, <laughs> debt is the worst, don't ever touch it, stay away from it no matter what. And on the other end, you have Robert Kiyosaki, and he says debt is your friend, use debt as much as you can, leverage as, as much as possible, cash is what the worst asset that you can have. So they're the two spectrums. My first bit of advice is you need to understand both of those points of view and choose where you lie there. Me personally, I'm maybe 80% of the way, 85% of the way towards the Robert Kiyosaki. I'm very much into leveraging debt, but I also like to have some cash reserves. I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't like bleeding my cash reserves dry. I, I do like to, you know, pay off and have some assets that I do own. Um, everyone's got to pick their, where they fall on the spectrum. That being said, whether you are leveraging that debt or you're building cash reserves without debt, the rule of thumb is if you can have three months worth of your fixed expenses, and I'll explain what fixed expenses are, but three months worth of your fixed expenses, you would be considered a healthy company. But I'm gonna take that a step further. From the companies that I have seen that I've worked with over time, if you have three months worth of fixed expenses, you're in the top 1% of companies and you are almost guaranteed to make it through your first five years. The companies that I've seen fail, they never have a reserve. Their, their cash flow is constantly, their, their bank account goes up to 500,000 and then it goes down to 20,000 right. and then it goes up to 200,000 and then down to 40,000. And it's just all over the place. And that I'm, just, I'm sure that these entrepreneurs don't sleep because when I talk to them, they're stressing like no other, trying to figure out where they can get the next bit of money. Um, if you, but if you can get three months worth of fixed expenses saved up, then you're in a really good spot. Now, when I say fixed expenses, that is anything that's not tied to a sale. So something that would be tied to a sale is inventory, right? So you, you make a sale of a widget and the widget costs you $5. That, that's not a fixed expense. That's a variable expense. If you're in the service industry, then your fixed expenses are going to be um, your salaries that are not contracted. Um, so you can talk to your accountant and, and make sure that you understand what your fixed expenses are. Uh, and, and one other thing I'll say to that, if you're a very fast growing company, you're going to be chasing that three month supply. It, that's just the way it is. If, if you're you know, doubling in revenue every year, it's going to be very hard for you to get that three month supply because every time you hit it, well, that's what would have been three month supply six months ago. And now your three month supply is double. That's a great problem to have. Just keep chasing that. As long Makes as you're sense. chasing it and you're getting on the way there, you're in a good position. I like, Michael, how you bring up the growth, how the benchmark obviously moves as well. So if you're stagnant, you can do it. But if you're growing, there's risk across both sides. But there is also a risk of too fast growth. So I'm sure that your expertise provides your clients the ability to control their growth. Uh, you know, before yep. we wrap up, guys, I do have an important one for Michael. Michael, you... Obviously, I spoke about the accent and the level of sophistication. When I, you know, I think I think it's there behind the accent as well, but the <laughs> accent definitely helps. But I'd like to know, Michael, you know, the way that you're talking, the knowledge base that you have, the the thought, the strategic thought process that you have for your clients, you didn't just get this way. So I'm going to have to know off the top of your head, for the be personally for your business or for your client's business. What was the last largest or most dramatic mistake you made that you didn't see coming? Oh, 
the largest. Okay, I can tell you the largest mistake I've made. I, you didn't um, even hesitate, I, Michael. It is the yeah. answer is important to me. I've always said this for years. The answer is always important that you're going to get to. It's always fun yeah. for me to watch how long it takes someone to access that very traumatic experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, the largest mistake I made, and I don't know if this is the last one that I made, but it was when I was a CFO at, at a company um, that did import-export, basically. They, they managed the import oh, was that Van, Was that Vandalay Industries? No, no, not Vandalay. <laughs> sorry, that's a George Costanza but, Seinfeld reference. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so what happened, and this was, this was probably one of the most stressful days of my life, um, I, I was in charge of preparing the wires that we were going to send to factories when they were larger. So if it was a larger wire, I, I would be in charge of preparing it. Smaller ones, we'd have the bookkeepers and everything just so that we had that control. I would prepare the wire and then it would get approved by uh, one of the owners, uh, the, either the CEO or, or the chief of operations. I prepared the wire. I, I put in uh, the amount and then I sent it off. Um, and the, the, one of the owners approved it. And right after he approved that, I realized that I'd added an extra zero. And oh. that was probably <laughs> the most stressful time oh of my, my life. Gosh. An extra zero. <laughs> yeah. An extra zero. And, and it just, uh, you know, as a startup, adding one extra zero can really make a big difference for you. Um, <laughs> unfortunately we had cash in the bank to afford it, which meant the wire went through. Um, luckily though, we, you know, we were able to talk to the factory that we'd sent the money to and, uh, they, they refunded us a, a portion of the money and then held onto a portion for the upcoming order that we had. So it was all okay. Despite that, uh, I, I can't even tell you how stressed I was for, you know, the, the next 24 hours while we were trying to figure that out. I like um, what you said though. Unfortunately, we had the money in the account. Because yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't there, you're safe by that, of course. It, yeah, it would have automatically stopped. <laughs> well, this but is... Yeah, uh, so that's the biggest say, one that I, I made. This has been um, tremendous information. You know, when business owners start looking at, at things that you do, financial strategy and growth uh, planning, um, tax management and, you know, entity uh, setup. Uh, creating efficiencies in the business, whether they're a service business or a manufacturing business. Uh, how do people engage in you uh, at High Country Finance? How do the services work? And how can people get in touch with you if they want to hire you, whether it's as big as an outsourced CFO or just some consultancy on the business? Yeah, it's a great question. And thanks for asking that. So um, in our company, there's two owners. There's Brady Slack and myself. Brady Slack is the tax guy and I'm the accounting and CFO guy. He does all the stuff I don't like to do and I do all, do all the stuff that he doesn't like to do. Um, so if, if you're interested in any services, whether it be from tax management, tax strategy, tax filing, all the way through bookkeeping and accounting and CFO services, um, please reach out to us. Send us an email at info at highcountryfinance.com. Um, Brady is very active on social media. So if you search the Brady Slack on uh, Instagram or uh, TikTok, I actually don't know what other platforms he's on. I'm sure he's on others too. He's, I think I know he's on YouTube. Um, he, he has a lot of really good tax strategy uh, content. Uh, but yeah, we'd, we'd love to, if, if you have any questions, if you want further clarification on some of these strategies, we'd love to talk to you and um, get to know your business and, and help you grow. That's awesome. Um, I, and I think this is something that business owners need. I always felt some of the biggest mistakes is when they try to do their own bookkeeping and their own entity planning and, and legal and tax. And these kinds of things are mistakes owners make early in that just really bite them down the road when they build the business. Uh, so uh, great, great, great information. Um, we're, we're super excited about it. We appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast today and, and teaching our owners that are either starting a business or scaling a business or, or one day thinking about exit stage left, these important considerations to think about in the business. Appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys. Thank Folks, you, we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. We're bringing on, we've got so many good guests that are coming on here in all different types of businesses. And we look forward to seeing you all next week right here on the Shrimp Tank. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond.